Mission Performance and Delivery Unit, PADU. Dr. Habibah Abdul Rahim has been serving at the Ministry of Education, Malaysia, for more than 25 years. She is currently the Executive Director in the Education Performance and Delivery Unit, PADU, responsible for the development of the Malaysian Education Blueprint and the monitoring and problem-solving delivery of blueprint initiatives and outcomes. Dr. Habiba is also a senior lecturer at the Institute Aminuddin Baki and was formerly the head of the Delivery Management Office for the Education National Key Economic Area, NKEA, responsible for managing and facilitating the delivery of major entry point projects for the education sector. Dr. Habiba has extensive experience across education policy, planning, research, and development. Today, Dr. Habiba will be presenting a topic which I find a very interesting, STEM for future education, science, technology, edu um, engineering, and mathematics for future education. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. Uh, I think as uh, what our uh, uh, just mentioned just now on STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, for Malaysia's context, uh, I think uh, it's new. It's a new thing, but before this, we usually mention it as uh, SNT, science and technology, or science and technical uh, versus the arts. Uh, but recently, definitely in the Malaysia Education Blueprint that has been mentioned earlier. Uh, for the next 13 years, we have included STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, in this context, if we compare it with other countries, uh, STEM has got various definitions, but what does it mean within the Malaysian context? Uh, I think we see it from two perspectives. Um, if we look across time, when it was referred to as, as science and technical, or even science for short, it's always been related to pushing the numbers of people within the science uh, stream. And um, it was as the silo approach of um, enhancement of learning uh, in the subject areas. But we can also see nowadays whereby it's being referred to as a more integrated approach where the core concepts uh, of science, technology, engineering and mathematics are being emphasized, being applied across other subject areas as well. And through my presentation, I think you will see both either as separately uh, pushing the numbers into those uh, subject areas also as an integrated approach. Okay, where does this all uh, came about? What is the context for this? Uh, I think we all know that for Malaysia, we aspire to be a developed nation by 2020. And we are already at the last five years of the journey before we reach 2020. And at this point of time, we are facing uh, things which, when we first started with Vision 2020 in 1991, that we did not uh, think about or we did not experience before. Uh, currently, we see that uh, Malaysia today live longer. We have rising life uh, expect uh, expectancy, uh, whereby the average uh, age now is 75 years. It has increased more than 10 times since the 1980s. Um, we see uh, in 2010, for instance, our population was 28.6 million, uh, but by this year, it would be uh, 30.5 million uh, by projection. However, the population growth rate has declined, and this is due to the dropping of the fertility rates. Now, this demographics uh, would change the shape of the workforce. It influences the overall human capital development in terms of the supply and demand. And coupled with other things that's happening, like urbanization, industrialization, uh, resources getting scarcer, and we see advancements in science, technology, and innovation. I think today, from morning till now, we hear about a lot about technology, about science. Right? Things are changing, 
and there are, and these changes bring about demands for new jobs and this require a combination of complex technical analytical as well as interactive skills uh, we are we say that you know we want to move we want a shift from labor intensive to more of knowledge based innovation uh, e economy so this would have demands on greater uh, skilled areas with a lot of emphasis on the STEM areas. Uh, so this is a quote um, uh, from, uh, that we have fitted into our education blueprint, uh, whereby um, just like any other developing nation, Malaysia too needs experts in the fields of STEM. Um, and if there's a drop in the interest in such subjects, uh, it may stunt our efforts to improve uh, technological in innovations to make us a high-income nation. Uh, likewise, more recently, by Datuk Seri Idris Jala, uh, who talks about uh, our requirement for competent and highly skilled workers by 2020 to keep uh, the competitive age. Uh, the scarcity and the demand for such highly skilled uh, jobs are also seen in, for instance, uh, what are the highest paid uh, fresh graduate jobs. Uh, we see that six out of ten of them are STEM related. And even if we compare from fresh graduates to the managerial level, nine out of ten of the highest paid jobs are STEM related. So what has been the impetus uh, for this STEM, right? It all started a long time ago, uh, in 1967, whereby the Higher Education Planning Committee reported that only 4% of our secondary school uh, students continue to tertiary level in science and technology fields. Only 4%. So if we are going to move towards greater innovation, moving from agricultural more to production, productivity. Now this requires more people into these fields. Thus, uh, the decision was made at that point of time to push for the 60-40 uh, science to arts uh, policy. And in years to come, there are policies set in place, plans set in place, to push uh, the ratio of this 60-40. Among others, for instance, the National Science and Technology Policy in 1986, and a second one in 2003 that set the tools as well as the framework in order to create uh, more human resources in the science and technology. And more recently, for instance, in the Economic Transformation Program, and the Enabler Human Capital Development Strategic Reform Initiative, and even more recently in the uh, 10th and in the 11th Malaysia Plan, we see this being ad continuously being addressed. For instance, in the 11th Malaysia Plan that has just been launched, it is expected uh, that through the plan, it would create 1.5 million jobs by 2020, and these jobs uh, these jobs that are targeted to be created are shifting from low, uh, low skill to higher skilled jobs. And 60% of the jobs will be, uh, that are to be created are expected to uh, require technical vocational education and uh, training. So TVET uh, is seen as a game changer. And this is part of the STEM-related uh, uh, areas that we are talking about. And the Malaysia Education Blueprint, as mentioned, has a mention on the STEM as well. So now, uh, where are we in terms of education at the school level? So in terms of access or in terms of the numbers, 60-40, so across, I don't know, more than 30 years since the early uh, 1980s till the more recent, last year, 2014, we see that it has risen, 
but it's only to 46% in 2014 as compared to 32% in 1981. Not a big uh, achievement there. And we see that uh, not all students who meet the requirement to study science after PMR, PMR means uh, the assessment at that time for the lower secondary level, chose to do so at upper secondary. And we see that the number continued to shrink, whereby uh, those who graduated with a bachelor degree at our public or private universities, it fluctuates between uh, 40 uh, to 50 percent of those graduates in STEM. But we see that besides the numbers, what is the quality uh, of those students uh, that are in these uh, areas? Um, if we look at uh, our achievements uh, in public examinations, I know someone mentioned about public examination before, but uh, if we look at those achievements, which is our current measure of how students are performing, either at the primary or uh, at the secondary level, uh, overall, we see a positive, a positive trend, either measured in terms of uh, passes or in terms of uh, A's, right? uh, students who get A's in those examinations. But then we cannot remain to be um, village champions, jago kampung, as we call it. We need to compete uh, with other students in other education systems. And how are we uh, in that respect? So Malaysia takes part in uh, trends in international mathematics and science study uh, at grade uh, 8, uh, which is Form 2 here in Malaysia, or 14 years old. Uh, and it looks at how students uh, perform in science and mathematics, the knowledge, reasoning, application. Um, and we also take part in program for international student assessment. Uh, what uh, students at 15 year olds, 15 plus year olds, uh, in terms of reading, mathematics, and science. So we see that overall, our children are not performing that well. Say, for instance, in mathematics in teams across the four cycle that we have taken part since 1999 to 2011, that's the last, uh, there is a declining trend where before we were above international average and now we have fallen below international average. Likewise, for mathematics in PISA, right, we are bottom third, below Thailand. And what about science? Reflecting what we have achieved for mathematics, for science, teams across the four cycle, again, we have dropped before inter, uh, below international average. And for PISA, we are bottom third in science as well. That is in terms of relative, relative comparison. But how have we performed in terms of our absolute uh, performance, right? So compared to when we took part 10 years ago uh, in 2011, for mathematics, our students are, uh, if you look at the blue, blue bar, uh, those who do not meet the minimum uh, standards. It has, for mathematics, it has increased five times. And for science, it has increased three times, threefold, right? So we are not doing well at all in terms of how we are performing in our science and mathematics, either in terms of pushing the numbers into those areas or in terms of um, the quality uh, of our students in those subjects. So what are some of the roadblocks? So we hear some of our students say that, what's the use of learning mathematics? Can science graduates make a living? So this is awareness of you know, what can you do with that subject? How is it applied uh, within our everyday life? And can we, uh, the career, uh, the prospect of being in those areas? Um, and the perception that uh, science is difficult, arts is easier to pass 
uh, and thus getting good results. Right? Um, again, biology, chemistry is difficult. Uh, lots of definition, terms to memorize, uh, facts to remember. Right? Um, classes are boring because we copy notes. Uh, we do a lot of uh, worksheets. Uh, experiments are not done uh, because we don't have uh, the labs or we do have the labs but we don't do experiments within those labs right we do the experiments on the worksheets right okay so in sum there's limited awareness about stem there's a general lack um, of awareness among students parents of the value of stem learning and also its relevance to everyday life and also STEM related career opportunities. There's also perceived difficulty of STEM subjects. Uh, there's a perception among students and parents that STEM subjects are harder than art subjects to excel and thus would jeopardize their results, thus opting for the arts instead of the science. Um, teachers and school administrators too uh, may sometimes share this perception and thus do not proactively encourage students to choose uh, the science stream. It's also seen as content-heavy curriculum. I suppose it's because teachers are pushing the content, the facts, uh, but not getting the interest of the students in terms of the skills, the values within those subject areas inconsistent quality of teaching and learning, limited and outdated infrastructure. So what is being done currently, especially through the Malaysia Education Blueprint? I think there's many that's being done, but I will focus on three um, areas, which is the curriculum, instruction or pedagogy, and the assessment. Um, when we heard about the early uh, childhood education just now, uh, it was mentioned about the three R's and the importance of the reasoning. Thus, uh, we have a new uh, primary uh, curriculum or the KSSR, Curriculum Standard Scholar Renda, uh, which was introduced in 2010. Uh, so the full cycle uh, will be uh, next year. Uh, this new curriculum has shifted the focus on not just the reading, writing and arithmetic but we have also included reasoning within the curriculum and also enhanced the pillars within the curriculum design whereby science and technology is also one of the pillar. So it, it's not science and technology as a subject but it's across the curriculum. So you may have for instance science and technology even within uh, the Bahasa Melayu, the language curriculum, right? Because there are concepts uh, that can be instilled, that can be integrated across the subjects. We um, conducted a curriculum benchmarking uh, against um, uh, Singapore as well as the UK curriculum as, and the TIMS and PISA framework. And we do that for the mathematics, science, and English at primary as well at secondary level. Also for those subjects uh, in our UPSR, primary uh, assessment and SPM, uh, secondary uh, level assessment. Um, based on the benchmarking, a, a revised uh, primary curriculum and a new secondary curriculum will be introduced in 2017. And I think one of the comments that were made uh, was that uh, in terms of content, uh, we are comparable in those subjects, uh, but a little bit less so for English. What we are lacking is the emphasis on higher order thinking. Right? So what we have done based on the learnings from those from that benchmarking, uh, as well as comparing with other systems, we are trying to provide pedagogical support to incorporate 
uh, more higher order thinking in teaching and learning. So our teachers definitely need to be upskilled because we have always been heavily uh, invested on content. So I think one of the questions that was posed uh, to Andrew Slyker, uh, he's an expert at the OECD, uh, and among those people who designed uh, the PISA, um, we asked why that we see a positive uh, projection uh, on our uh, internal results, but not at the international level. So what the response that he gave was perhaps the things that's valued by our education system is not the same as what's being valued in other education systems. So if our parents, our society, are pushing for children to perform well in the public examinations, there's high stake on that public examination, and the public examination are focusing a lot on facts, memorization, and recall, thus school would be pushed towards delivering that, right? So schools would be teaching to that test that is high stake, right? So our teachers need to be upskilled because now if we are putting in more higher order thinking skills in the teaching and learning, they would need to be able to do so in the classrooms, right? So there is also support by school improvement specialist coaches or, or SISC plus, uh, as well as facilinos or facilitators for our literacy and numeracy program uh, in the first three years of primary schooling. Uh, besides upskilling, we also provide materials for teachers like the e-guru videos uh, online, resources including uh, modules uh, on HOTS, higher order thinking, uh, as well as item creation. How do you create items on HOTS? Uh, we also provide thinking tools uh, so that teachers can use it within the classroom. For instance, one of the thinking tools is called I Think, uh, which is a project with uh, AIM, uh, Agency Innovasi Malaysia, Malaysia Innovation Agency. Okay, the other is the 21st century uh, classroom that we have newly introduced and piloted in several states, including in Kelantan, for instance, in Johor, whereby it's not just a matter of the classroom, but classroom does matter in terms of how it's being arranged, whether it's classroom style, whether it's for group work, and we saw uh, in the trust school model that was shown before this, you know, for children to have that collaboration, for that to happen, then that cannot be if uh, tables are, and chairs are arranged classroom style, right? So how the class table, chairs, the airing, the lighting, uh, whether there's computers, whether it's connected is important. But besides that, it's also the teachers that has to change uh, his or her role from being uh, using, for instance, the talk and chalk method the teaching classroom method uh, to being facilitators, changing uh, the teacher's role, as well as how things are happening within the classroom. So we saw about the 4C uh, that was uh, scribbled uh, in the session uh, with the educators uh, in, in the trust school, uh, in the session before this, in the presentation before this. So that's what we are encouraging within the 21st century classroom a different way of arranging classrooms, creating the environment for learning, uh, teachers playing a different role, uh, the method of the pedagogy is different so that it's more creative, encourages inquiry, problem solving, collaboration, creativity and innovation. Now back to what I said earlier that our assessment has been more on facts, memorization, recall, so now there's nothing wrong with assessments, right? But the assessment must be something worth teaching to. Uh, so if, for instance, we are pushing from the written curriculum, HOTS, uh, 
we need to push at the other end as well, right? Then someone commented earlier that if it's something that's not being assessed, you know, teachers may not teach it, although it's written, right? But if it's something that's also being assessed, thus you're pushing it at both ends. It's written within the curriculum, you're also assessing students on that. So we have targeted to increase uh, hot items in the public uh, uh, assessments uh, up to 40% at the primary level and 50% at the secondary level. So currently it is at uh, 20% uh, and we have some issues there because what would happen if we start introducing hot items in our assessment? What would happen? Anybody? Would results go up? Would results stay or drop? In the early years, what would happen? You think it would drop? It dropped. It dropped, yeah. Because students are not used to it, although we are trying to push it through the upskilling you've seen uh, that was mentioned earlier. But then, upskilling that happens, whether through face-to-face -face or online, doesn't mean it will actually happen within the classroom itself. So our evaluation of samples of um, uh, teaching and learning uh, lessons, we've seen only a third of that sample actually uh, being conducted, integrating HOTS within the classroom. So if now children are not used to those uh, higher order thinking items in the assessment in the classrooms, thus they may not be able to answer as well uh, within the assessment. Thus it dropped. This year, we have maintained it at 20%, same as last year. But the comment was uh, after the UPSR or primary uh, assessment, uh, the comment made public by teachers, how come this year there's a lot more hot items within the assessment? Actually, it's not. It's the same. But that's the impression, right? It, it seems harder. Okay, um, other than that, as mentioned earlier, we want more of higher skilled uh, workers uh, because the jobs created, 60% of those jobs would be in the TVET areas, right? So we have um, introduced a basic vocational uh, education as early as uh, lower secondary level, um, what we call as the PAV or basic education, uh, vocational education. We at uh, 85 schools. We have introduced a high impact as well as high demand programs such as marine, uh, aviation, automotive, and this is at our college vocational by the Ministry of Education. This is secondary schools being upgraded to college and providing diploma certificates as well as uh, the SKM or skill uh, certificate uh, that is accepted by the industry. This is to add value to the vocational uh, education and training provided by the Ministry of Education or its programs being run by the private or other uh, public agencies that we are buying seats from. Okay, I think um, to end, um, the Ministry is trying to change through the Malaysia Education Blueprint in not just pushing uh, children to take up uh, STEM, but also to integrate the STEM across uh, the curriculum because it is something that is being valued in the 21st century. So some people have called it as 21st century skills, some have called it hot, some have called it 21st century learning, but this is what we're trying to do. But at the same time, the school is also trying to change from being a school system where teaching and learning happens only within the school. It has to also embrace and learning happens even outside the four walls. The other is that experts are not just within the classroom among the teachers. Experts can also be 
uh, within the communities, the private sector, outside the four walls, even through we hear today uh, through internet, online, etc. Thus, we are changing, trying to transform from a school system into what we call a learning uh, system and trying to include more participation from parents, community, private sectors and using technology in communication and learning. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. Any questions uh, for Dr. Habiba? Are there any questions? Yes, one question. Kindly introduce yourself. I'm Siti Norohoja from UKM. Uh, can you please explain to us why that the uh, the 6040, uh, 4060 of uh, the weightage, uh, um, until now we cannot maintain to reach, uh, to arrive to that um, uh, portion. Why? Why that happen? Yeah. I think there's, there's two, uh, actually there's two separate questions there. One is why the ratio 6040, and then the other is, um, if we have set it at 60-40, why we haven't achieved it, right? So I think uh, the easier is why the numbers have not increased much, uh, even after 30 years, or if from the beginning of 1967, almost 50 years. I think it's because there's a lot uh, that some of which I have mentioned, uh, uh, how people uh, perceive about, about uh, science and technology or STEM areas. Uh, difficult, the difficulty and what career that you can uh, go into after that. Uh, but I think why that ratio 60-40, it was a projection at that point of time in 1967 in terms of the development that's going to happen uh, for the nation and thus the requirement to develop people at higher, at, uh, higher uh, education institutions. So the school is being the feeder for the higher education system as well as uh, the work. So at that point of time, I think that was the calculation uh, in terms of the requirement uh, for national uh, development. But interestingly, uh, that ratio is being um, uh, researched. Uh, uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's now being done by UIA. The ministry has uh, sourced it out to UIA to look at uh, whether that 60-40 uh, is the correct ratio, and if it is, then uh, how, uh, what are the recommendations uh, to achieve that ratio? Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Again, this is just for shared information and shared learning. Uh, I think Malaysia is not alone in facing that uh, shortage in STEM skills. Uh, we see that in the UK as well. Uh, we see that there's a dire um, shortage of STEM skills uh, across uh, sectors. Um, it, is, it, it is unprecedented that now even the financial sector in, uh, in the UK is actually fighting to get STEM graduates and they are losing quite badly to IT. Uh, since now in the UK, the, uh, the young startups the IT startup is, 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 is getting really, you know, like hot cakes. You see uh, Google, Microsoft, all of them have developed their own academy. So uh, the government now has uh, recently launched what is it as apprenticeship. This is to accelerate uh, learning uh, among the young, um, the, young, the young ones. So you see that there is a shortcut there. Instead of going to universities, they go straight into apprenticeships uh, offered by um, many private sector uh, organizations. So there's a fierce uh, competition for uh, STEM talents. So that's, you know, that makes you feel a bit better, actually, <laughs> that Malaysia is not alone in this war. Thank you. I believe there's one more question, uh, our last question. Dr. Habiba. Okay, Assalamualaikum, uh, Dr. Habiba. Saya Nur Hayati Abdul Hamid from NLI Education Sri Barhad. Uh, the one question is that, uh, one of what, um, how do you see, uh, how could uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, 21st century education as perceived by uh, the way ahead in, into the future uh, can get uh, the support from the parents. As I see, your uh, doctor have been mentioning that uh, the school heads would, be, would always be sort of uh, pressured uh, by the expectation of the parents, yeah? the, one of the stakeholders of the education would be the parents. So somehow, um, how do you think, how, how do you see uh, what percentage of uh, increment may there be if the parents are, are giving more, uh, uh, more training, more sort of uh, pressure, but some kind of, uh, since the school, the, the family or the, the family is also a learning institution, whereby if we can put that into the into the scenario of uh, of uh, uh, education for the 21st century getting the parents of the family institutions it, as part of the in the into the scenario really i mean a stro stronger rather than just a side a sideline watcher yeah. yeah that's all yeah. I, could. I think that's a very good uh, comment because I think even even uh, as I've mentioned that UIA is still conducting, uh, is still work in pro uh, progress in terms of the research, but they have presented an interim report. And the interim definitely shows that peers and parents play a big role in influencing students whether they do take up uh, STEM-related uh, subjects. Um, because uh, those are among the biggest influence that we've seen thus far in the interim, interim report. So if we want to, if 6040 is the right figure or whatever that figure uh, does come up to, uh, how do we encourage more to enter the science, uh, to the STEM related fields? I think that, you know, um, among the many things that we do, we may think that the planning, you know, the monitoring uh, is important, but uh, if we want change to happen, it's the people that we need to, to tackle. Uh, what have we done in terms of the change management that we do, uh, in terms of creating that awareness, in terms of uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, educating our public, especially the parents, uh, because they are the ones who are the biggest uh, influence in getting their children into STEM-related fields. So if we are very serious in uh, trying to achieve uh, that ratio and in trying to push uh, our nation in terms of knowledge-based innovation uh, economy, and definitely is being pushed by science, uh, by STEM, uh, as well as uh, TVET is part of it, uh, then we need to do that change management, creating that awareness, educating uh, public, including the parents. Um, the other is, I think, that uh, the ministry has done the roadshows. And uh, besides that, even if children do not get into those uh, STEM-related fields, but then uh, to start even uh, embracing and having uh, the concepts uh, that's valued within the STEM fields, uh, as, I, as what I've mentioned, HOTS, uh, that need to be understood by the public as well. Uh, because they cannot uh, longer, any longer, uh, expect our assessment, for instance, uh, number, number 10, the question would look like this. Because uh, parents always buy books, uh, workbooks or pass your exams, right, uh, for their children and they practice and usually it follows a certain structure. So number 10 would be this kind of question, right? So when they sit for the assessment, suddenly number 10 doesn't look like that. Or number 10 is now worded differently, right? Now it's no longer just changing the example or, or in chemistry, the chemical that's being used. Now it's a different situation, one that they are not familiar with uh, what will happen, right? So I think that when we try to change, it's not just the teachers or the school that we need to handle, that need to be able to do that pedagogy within the classroom. It's not only the preparation of the students, but also uh, the parents and the community. Because, as our minister says, do a previous minister as well as current minister, our stakeholder is the 30 million. 
everybody seems to be interested in education one way or another because it affects their children, their relatives' children, you know, the whole nation, right? And that's it. Thank you, Dr.